Hello, everybody, and good day to you. And here we have a special guest. This is Jose Hernandez from NASA, an honest-to-goodness real astronaut right here visiting in McAllen. How are you today, sir? I'm doing great, Neil. How about yourself? Well, so far, it's a very, very, very good day. Now, let me, how long have you been an astronaut? I have been an astronaut since 2004. I was in the uh, 2004 class where we got selected and, uh, and uh, basically trained for two years until 2006. That's when we became eligible for flight assignments. And uh, in 2008, I got my first flight assignment and then I uh, realized the mission STS-128 in 2009, uh, August through September of last year. Not that long ago. Not that long ago, exactly. Yeah. Now, as you said, you told me you're originally from California. And well, that's not too far away from Texas. No, <laughs> I've, I've driven it every summer to go uh, take my kids to grandma and grandpa. and It's a long distance. Now, one thing that everybody really wants to know uh, about you know, being an astronaut is the study, the work that it takes to get there. I mean, it's just not a job you go apply for, is it? That's right. It's, it's nothing you decide on the whim and say, okay, I think I'll be an astronaut tomorrow. It's something you got to plan for for your whole life uh, and you need an element of uh, preparation. That means you got to get yourself a good education in the science fields. You got to have a, uh, a good plan to get the right experience so that NASA takes a look at you. And most importantly, you got to have perseverance. Uh, it took me 12 years to get selected as an astronaut. How many times did you apply? 12 times I applied. Usually they select a class every two or four years. The first six years, they just sent me form letters saying, don't call us, we'll call you. And in the last six years, I interviewed for three classes. And it was on the third try that, you know, say third time's a charm, I got selected in 2004. Well, that's a, that's a common story that I know of. Of course, I've only talked to Mike Fossum, who grew up here in McAllen, and he applied seven or eight times. That's correct. That's correct. And Mike Fossum is my office mate. So uh, his, his desk is right next to mine. And uh, as a matter of fact, he kind of gets mad at me a little bit because he thinks I'm moving in on his turf, coming here to the valley and uh, talking to the kids, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, it's so nice that you do talk to the kids. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think uh, kids need role models, and, uh, and I understand the importance of being a role model because what got me interested or actually uh, had me make the promise, personal promise to myself of becoming an astronaut was when I heard that the first Latino American got selected as an astronaut, that was Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz. Back in 1980, I was a, 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 a senior in high school, and I heard that news, and once I saw someone that looked like me that was gonna be an astronaut, I said, well, hey, if he can do it, why can't I? And so that's what. Do they ask you that question when you talk to, to kids in schools? What question? About, you say, hey, if you can do it, can I do it? Absolutely, I think, I think it's more from just showing them you know, uh, basically talking about myself, the experiences that I have, and making them realize that, hey, you know, that guy's not too different from me, and he was able to be an astronaut, so why can't I do it? I, want, I like them to arrive at that conclusion on their own, and then I think by doing, telling the story of my background, mm -hmm. that they kind of come to that conclusion at the end, because that's what I came to that conclusion when I heard that Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz got selected. But as you said, you had to, to get the education and you had to make yourself eligible for the job. That's correct, that's correct. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's only an opportunity if you're prepared for it, if you prepare yourself for it. Else it's not an opportunity because you're not gonna be qualified to take advantage of that opportunity. So you have to prepare yourself and, and education's the key to preparing yourself. Now you mentioned it, wasn't that few, many months ago you got to fly? Do you have any other assignments that are in the future right now? No, uh, I think they may be sending me to headquarters for about six months to uh, help out over there. I uh, understand they need a little bit of help over there, and, uh, and, but, but uh, my expectation is I'm going to come back and, uh, and fly a long duration flight just like Mike Folsom for six months. Okay, and you're up in the... Uh, up on the Soyuz, uh, up on the International Space Station, yes. Wow. Now that's, is that considered a plum assignment? A good one? It's considered an assignment. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more uh, commitment with respect to training. You have to train for two and a half years, and half of that time is out of this country, your training, because it's an international space station. So you're, the modules that are there, you have to train in other countries. And then, you know, to, then when you come back from your two and a half years of training, you're going to be gone for six months. So, so it's, not a, uh, it's, it's, it's something you've got to think about before you, say, you, you know, sign on a dotted line saying, I'll fly on station. 
but it's different, it's unique, it sounds exciting. Yes. Yeah, it's up in space. It's yes, being in a zero G environment. Now, when you're in a zero G environment, they say it atrophies your muscles a little bit. Do you have to work at that when you're up there? Absolutely. You you have a muscle atrophy because of the fact that you're in a zero G environment. You're not using your leg muscles. Uh, you, you're not using much of your arm muscles because everything floats. You can be carrying a refrigerator, and you know you're not exerting yourself. And so we have a uh, uh, pieces of equipment out there on the International Space Station, and we have an exercise protocol that astronauts have to exercise at least one full hour uh, a day just to uh, mitigate the effects of muscle atrophy and also bone density loss. Okay, so you have to work at that to yes. prevent it from exactly, occurring. exactly. We have to work hard at it to prevent it. Now, one thing that Fossum told me way back when, he says, when you're on the flight, when you, when you get to go up there, he says, you really don't sleep because you're working all the time and you're really excited. Is that true? That's yeah, true. That's true. But I did sleep. I mean, I had no problem sleeping. I mean, you know, you talk about, uh, or, you know, tempurpedic uh, mattresses. Well, you know, in space, you know, you're just floating up there and that's the ultimate mattress, you know, because there's no pressure points on your body. You're in a sleeping bag and you zip yourself up, you make sure you tie the corners of the sleeping bag because if not you're going to float all over the place. But it's so peaceful, it's so peaceful because you have no pressure points and uh, it, it, it's amazing. I, I had no problem sleeping up in space. And is it true that you use a lot of Velcro in the space station? Absolutely, everything because you know, in, in, you know, the littlest things here on the ground that we take for granted become big jobs up in space. You know, when you here at in the ground, you would think nothing of, of, of eating three or four different items during your lunch. You know, you got your peas, your carrots, your meat, and, and other vegetables, and your bread. Well, in space, guess what? You have to be hanging on to everything because if you just let it go for a little while, you turn your head and then you look for it, it's gone. So you, everything has to have your, your water bag has to have Velcro. You know, the little containers that have the food has Velcro because you, know, you get a little bit of something, put it there, grab it and get a little bit of something and stick it back on Velcro. Oh, wow. So yeah, Velcro is our friend up in space. That sounds wonderful. Now, what do they have you doing in McAllen right now? Well, right now, I'm talking to, uh, to a bunch of uh, high school kids and it's a dual enrollment program from what I understand. These kids in, in high school are enrolled uh, in a high school where they also take college courses and after four years of high school they walk away with an AA degree, uh, two years of college and their high school diploma which I think it's a great opportunity for them to get a head start on their college education and I'm, I'm here just to talk a little bit about, about STEM, uh, about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, get the kids excited about these career fields because you know these kids are our future and if our country is going to stay at the forefront of technology, we have to engage every segment of our population to science and technology. And uh, of course, here in the Valley, they're as important as anywhere else in the country. Now that's, that's, that's so true. And anybody can do it today. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, the thing is, you just got to be willing to put the work in, burn that midnight oil, and you know, get your degree, and you can be an engineer. Anyone can be an engineer. Anyone can be an astronaut if they want. Now, as you said, you can't give up? You can't give up. Perseverance. Perseverance. It took me 12 years. Imagine if I would have given up after the second, third year. And I tell the kids, imagine if I would have given up after the 11th year. I mean, you just don't give up. As long as you keep improving yourself year after year, you got a reason to try again. Just keep trying. Eventually, you'll get there. Wonderful story. And, and it's ringing true. It's ringing true. Look, here you are. That's right. And there you were. And there I was. It was great. I mean, we were up there 14 days. Uh -huh. went around the world 217 times every 90 minutes we were going around the world and logged more than 5.4 million miles. You know, it's too bad NASA doesn't have frequent flyer partnership programs with, with uh, airlines because then I'll be sitting pretty with Well, can you compare that with pilots? You know, how many hours do you have? Absolutely. Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. Jose Hernandez, thank you so much. Wonderful information. Great conversation. Neil, it's great being here and thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you for visiting. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Thank and you. thank you for watching. I'm Neil Canales, MCN.